chapter of the second. Yeah, thank you for such a recording. Um, this is uh, uh, just for those who are new, uh, newly arrived or uh, new to our series. Uh, I'll just say a few things about our uh, about uh, what is uh, about the concept uh, and what it um, from where we uh, we start or from where do we come. Um, it's uh, basically uh, about exploring the imagination and representation of Muslim women in history and in today. Uh, in, in all these fields of art, literature, history, archaeology, and social sciences, um, uh, we are including in this series speakers from the MENA region as well as from all over the globe. So it's not really specific when it comes to who is speaking. Uh, the meeting point of these speakers uh, actually is their research on on the women of the region um, through their multi and interdisciplinary distinctive innovative and creative approaches to their fields and how they deconstruct the stereotypes of Muslim women and emphasize their diversity um, you are very aware of the complexity of our region uh, so this series, which is envisaged as a platform for debate among academics, students, and the general public, with interest in the broader theme of women in, and gender in the MENA region, it started last year, the, of, of the 1st of uh, December, 21, and has run through the end, uh, through until the end of uh, academic year of 21-22. Uh, on Zoom platform. It's now starting its second round for 22-23, which we hope will uh, be as lively as, and wide-reaching as the last round. Um, as who, who is organizing this? Um, the organizers uh, are both uh, Professor Zahia as well as, as me. Um, Professor Zahia is the chair of Modern Arabic Studies at the University of Manchester. I'm a visiting senior researcher, um, research fellow at the university at the, the same department. And I used to work um, at the International Affairs Department at Qatar University and History Department of King Saudi University earlier. Um, we are both happy to invite you to engage in a women and gender discussion, which defeats the geographical boundaries and extends the opportunity to participate for to participants from all over the world. To you, Zahia. Uh, you're muted. Yeah, thank you very much, Patrol. And could everyone mute themselves if there is a noise that's interfering? Thank you very much. Okay, so over to you, Ikram. A few words. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zahia. Hello, everyone. My name is Ikram. I'm a fourth year uh, PhD student, and a great portion of my research revolves um, around women. The sound, or it's only me? Um, so a great portion of my work revolves around women and gender in the uh, 19th century age of colonialism. So the more I studied about gender and the colonial policy, the more I discovered that the perception of the, the set policy and the colonial space deferred on the basis of gender. A consideration of imperial uh, male narratives for example, reveals that the male dominate the male dominated sorry colonial authorities approach the native cultures of the East or the Orient and its people in order to institutionalize Western superiority. Whereas imperial women, on the other hand, seize the same opportunity to call for their emancipation and seek uh, personal liberation. In this regard, while imperial men aimed to assert cultural and political dominance, women sought to self-construct and self-discover in a space that remained familiar as it functioned on the colonial system of governance, yet foreign enough to grant them a level of freedom that they lacked in their uh, home countries. Um, a consideration of imperial women travel accounts on their own shows that while some uh, female travelers uh, used or employed their journeys uh, for political subjectivity, such as the case of Hubertine Auclair uh, in uh, Algeria, 
this journey was motivated by political subjectivity, other journeys were motivated by personal endeavors. If we take the case of Algeria, for example, you no know, colonial Algeria was not just an annex to the empire. It also represent, represented a new space for the French female travelers that was familiar, as I said, and foreign at the same time. It represented a destination where they can remain within the parameters of their own culture, yet still allowed them to discover themselves in ways that were not possible in metropolitan France. On this account, their narratives were an attempt to locate themselves in a space that was not necessarily French, yet was still assigned aspects of Frenchness. So this in its turn, uh, presented them with the opportunity to construct their own identity in a space that embodied familiarity and otherness all at once, because it, it constituted, as I mentioned, the encounter between a colonial system of governance and the Algerian culture, which was completely different uh, from their own. And such was the case uh, of the woman in question today, Isabel Aberhart, who escaped her life in the West to self-discover among the Algerian natives in the south of Algeria, which she chose as a final destination. Now, the same pattern of self-construction and self-discovery was also shared by the uh, Scottish Evelyn Cobalt, later known as Zaina, who spent most of her childhood in Algiers and Cairo in North Africa, among the North African Muslims, and converted to Islam in uh, 1915. Zainab Kobold wrote about Islam as she described it as the most calculated religion to solve the world's many perplexing problems and to bring to humanity peace and happiness. Now, both Isabel Eberhardt and Zainab Kobold chose Islam not as a rebellion against their uh, religions and cultures, but rather as a chance to express their selfhood in ways that were not possible in their uh, homelands among their own people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ikram. And over to you, Linda. Before that, let me introduce you. So Linda Schwitten is Professor of Literature at the University of Bumerdes in Algeria. She is a novelist and short story writer. Her novels won uh, some prestigious uh, prizes, such as the Asya Jabbar Prize in, in 2019. She is also an, an academic uh, researcher whose publications include uh, Commanding Words, Essays on the Discursive Constructions, Manifestations, and Subversions of Authority, published in 2016, and Isabel Eberhardt and North Africa, a carnivalesque mirage published in 2015. Her lecture today will focus on Isabel Abahart and her empowering journey through Islam in Algeria. Without further ado, over to you, Linda. I'm looking forward to listen to what you want to say. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks uh, very much uh, to all those who are attending. I'm very honored and pleased to be with you today uh, to inaugurate this uh, second year's Amos Lectures series. Um, I'd like to, to thank everybody, and in particular, um, Professor Zahia Ismail, uh, um, Zahia Ismail <laughs> Salahi, Zahia Ismail Salahi, for the invitation. And I'd like to thank also Hatun for all the advertising that she did out on the different social media. So as you have, uh, as Zahia has announced, my talk today is going to be about Isabella Berhardt's uh, is an Islam and Islam and in particular her representation of Islam and Muslims, North African Muslims in particular. This uh, talk draws heavily on, on the study that has also been mentioned by Zahia, which was published a few years ago, 2015, and it is entitled Isabella Berhardt and North Africa, a Carnivalesque Mirage. And the central thesis in this study is that Isabella Berhardt is not the iconoclast, iconoclast figure uh, that she is often taken to be. So I, I focus on two things in this study, on two aspects of her evolution in North Africa. First of all, uh, the fact that she was not immune to the to 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 to, 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 will, to will to power. She was very much interested in will to power. 
And this will to para, this quest for power was multifaceted in the sense that she wanted to become a famous writer. She wanted uh, to, at the beginning to take part in, in the fight for Islam. And later on, she wanted to take to, to, to support on the contrary, the colonial project. So um, she, she wanted to, um, to, to be to do something, something really that stands out but in different manners through literature, through through politics, through different, uh, and that's one aside. And another thing that I wanted to, that I have emphasized in this study is um, uh, her, the influence of the codes of her time. That is, she was not an iconoclast figure and she was not the feminist and the, the figure that she was supposed to be, that some uh, critics take out to be. So she was, uh, very much influenced by both the racial codes and uh, the gender codes of her time, um, in the sense that she associated masculinity with power in order to have power. And that's probably the reason why she disguised as a man. She called herself Mahmoud Sadi and she uh, roamed the uh, North Africa, the Algerian desert in, in male attire. But what I want to focus here today is the way uh, I wanted precisely to show the link between Islam as she practiced it and not to, and she, as she represented it in particular and, and this quest for power. Uh, Islam served her quest, of, I'm, I'm not saying that her conversion was not genuine. Uh, it was genuine. I mean, she, uh, there are lots of, lots of um, elements and uh, details in her journals in particular, which indicates that she, her faith was very much, was strong and sincere, but this did not prevent Islam from serving this quest for power in the sense that, uh, for example, she, by marrying a Muslim, it's paradoxically by marrying a Muslim that she became French, that she sealed her belonging to the French empire. Uh, in order to explain this, I have to say two words about Isabelle Eberhardt. Isabelle Eberhardt uh, was um, a, Sw a Swiss writer, um, when I say a Swiss writer, I mean she was born in Switzerland, but to Russian parents, to Russian parents, um, and she spent a, a very atypical ch childhood in uh, La Villeneuve, a very isolated house, ed ed educated by her tutor Alexander Trofimovsky. But she fell in love with North Africa from a very early age, even before setting foot there. And she visited Algeria for the first time at the age of 20 in 1897 with her mother. And they lived in the city of Annaba for some time and it is there that her mother died um, after having converted to Islam. Uh, her, her tomb is still present in the cemetery of Annaba today, uh, bearing the name of Fatima and Nubia. This is her, their, her Muslim, her mother's Muslim name, name. She returned to Switzerland after her mother's time, uh, uh, mother's death for some time. But, but after her tutor's death, she, would, she decided to settle in North Africa again and in the Algerian desert, precisely because she thought that the Algerian desert would provide her with interesting material for her literary career. Because she thought a few writers wrote about the Algerian desert, and that if she wrote about this part of the world and its people, this would help this would help her secure literary fame and success. And then she envisaged to return to uh, North of, to, to France after that. But things happened otherwise, and she spent most of her adult age uh, in North Africa and the, in the Algerian desert until he, her death in 1904. She was only, then only 27 years, years old. In, in the Algerian desert, when she arrived in the Algerian desert, she met Sliman Ahli, who would become her husband, Sliman Ahli, who was a spahi in, uh, in, in the French army. He worked in the French army, and as such, he had French, she was entitled to French citizenship. And precisely by marrying Sliman Ahni that she became herself French, because she was Swiss and Russian at the big, before that. So, and by becoming French, she, she would in turn act as a sort of a liaison agent between a French general, uh, whose name is General, Le General Lyoté. So General, she would be French General Lyoté, and General Lyoté uh, would ask her to do to to do something for him. And she would ask her, he would ask her to act as I have said as a liaison agent and the, the recalcitrant tribes of the Moroccan frontier. He was trying, General Lyoté was trying to annex the those tribes of Moro, the, those Moroccan tribes who were hostile, who were hostile to the French presence, presence. And he was and her role was to try to convince to convince these tribes to accept the French presence. Uh, th that's what she was supposed to do. And what is interesting, and this, will, this is going to be the focus of this talk, is that her representation of Islam 
uh, before she joined the colonial tra project through this association with General Lyoté, and after she joined, uh, is, is completely different. We will we'll see that uh, the, the, her earlier writings are marked, but there is her, her writing of Islam, her representation of Islam is, is marked, is gendered, is highly gendered. But the way she gendered Islam and Muslims in her earlier writings and the way she gendered him later or later on towards 1904, after she had befriended General Lyoté, changes completely. The, the earlier writings are, mar are, are marked by um, strong masculinization of of Islam and Muslims. And later on, um, of course, I will give several examples of that. And later on, uh, her, later, her later writings um, are marked by feminization of Muslim and, uh, associating, and the association between Muslims and such ideals as uh, tolerance, peace, uh, uh, the, the features, qualities that we traditionally consider to be feminine, because it was no longer in her interest that, um, the, my argument here is that it was no longer in, in her interest that um, the Muslims would be masculinized and associated with trans. She wanted, the, she wanted them, she wanted to dis describe soft Muslims in order to, so, so that they are more easily colonizable. I mean, in order to, um, uh, so, so that they, they are easy, more easily subjected to the, to, the, to, to the project which wanted to subject them to Islam. So I will start by, uh, since, uh, since everything turns about the idea of power, I would like to give instances of the way uh, Eberhardt in Islam, uh, Eberhardt's representation of Islam is precisely associated with power. In one of her numerous comments on Islam uh, that she inserts, inserts in her diary, Eberhardt writes, quote, but man's salvation is faith, the living faith that makes for strong souls, not faith that breaks one's will and energy, but that which exalts and magnifies them. So she speaks about faith as, uh, as, as strength, as uh, energy. And this, of course, departs, uh, clearly departs from uh, the Linda, you have muted yourself. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so uh, I have said this representation of Islam clearly departs from the traditional vision of Islam, uh, which is very common in the West, as a surrender of the will. Because Islam traditional uh, literally means to surrender one's to surrender to God. But uh, Eberhard, the way Eberhard represents Islam is uh, one that 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 that, that um, stimulates one's energy. That uh, that that. Uh, that empowers, that uh, encourages self-affirmation. And what she means by action and energy is not the daily practices of honest work and charitable behavior. There, uh, there, there are lots of, again, quotations from her journals which show that what she desired, what she desired through conversion to Islam was no, nothing less than uh, glory, uh, nobly deserved the glory. Desire, I quote her, I'm quoting her own words, desire for nobly deserved the glory. And she tells herself, go Mahmoud, accomplish great and beautiful things, be a hero. So she, she, she hers is a quest for heroism. She wants, she, uh, and, and she dreamt of, uh, as I have said, fighting for this cause of Islam, uh, that is a sort of taking part in a sort of jihad against the French colonizer. This was at the beginning of her, uh, in her arrival, just following her arrival uh, in, in North Africa. Of course, when she says, go Mahmoud, be a hero, she's speaking to herself because Mahmoud Saadi is the name she gave herself uh, when, she, when she dressed as a man, she disguised as a man. Uh, well, in North Africa. As well as wars evoke in glory and grandeur, Eberhardt frequently makes use of wars which evoke pride. And uh, in so doing, she, cl she clearly departs from the traditional religious valorization of humility, especially in Sufism. And she was herself a Sufi. So Sufism is a trend of Islam, which focuses more on the spiritual side of the faith, of, of, of religion than on the uh, strict uh, necessity uh, to observe the different duties, but that's it. So, um, and she, uh, to express, for example, the character, the, the unshakable character of the faith, she writes that hers is, quote, a proud and inflexible heart that has voluntarily given its whole self to this Islamic cause for which she would so much like to shed this burning blood 
that boils in her vein. So this joins what I have what I have said now. This desire for jihad, the desire to fight for the Islamic cause, and uh, to emphasize here a French resistance in the face of appalling poverty. She writes that she has nothing but coat. Uh, her religion and her pride. I have nothing but my religion and her pride. So you see, we have a uh, so religion, which in this case, Islam is associated with energy and strength of will, but it is also associated with 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 pride. So um, this already shows us that um, uh, Eberhard wanted to empower herself, and this joins what Ikram was uh, was saying. Uh, she she spoke more about discovering oneself, discovering oneself. But my point here is not just to discover oneself, but to empower oneself in this case through religion by associating it with energy and motivation and and, and pride. And now I'm going to show how in uh, how in early how uh, in her earlier she masculinized Islam in her earlier writings, um, uh, show sh show showing the virility of this religion essentially through the trope of uh, of the Moezin's call to prayer. Uh, for example, in one of her texts uh, entitled Blazonia, uh, the 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 Moezin's mighty mighty voice, very strong voice, echoes the strength of the believer's own faith and triggers in the narrator's mind the days of by bygone glory. I'm I'm going to go to the passage because I think it's very. Um, strike and the, the, the association, the presence of power, association between Islam of power and power is very um, obvious. So there in the antique shadow of the holy mosque of Islam, I felt ineffable emotions as I listened to the imam's high sounding and strong voice. He was reciting the age old words of the Islamic faith in that beautiful Arabic language, which is sonorous, virile, musical and powerful like the wind of the desert where it was born and from where, urged by a single human's will, it came to conquer half of the universe. So the words that we have here are clearly evoke power, high sounding, strong, sonorous, virile, uh, powerful, and con conquer, the verb to conquer. So of course, um, the, through all these words, there is not this celebration, there's an implicit, obvious, but though implicit celebration of the early Islamic conquests. Uh, in which faith as a fulfillment of God's will converges with a human's will towards the enactment of, of power. Uh, and in, in turn, the qualification of the call to prayer as, as virile completes the triangular schema in which we have Islam, masculinity, and power. The, th the three seem to go together in the Eber uh, Eberhardian mindset. In another text, in the daily journals, she describes other voices, the no, no, other believers' voices. Two voices, one voice in front of us broken and antiquated, but rising little by little, becoming strong and powerful. And the other voice bursting forth as if, as if from above in the mosque's far off corners, in the regular intervals, like a radiant song of triumph and unwavering faith, announcing the coming inevitable victory of God and his prophet. So again, here are plenty of words to just power, strong, powerful, rising, triumph, unwavering, inevitable. And it is as if this text were, were a supplement of the previous one. So the previous one speaks about the glorious past of Islam, the glorious conquest of Islam. And here she, she, she predicts a return of this bygone glory, a uh, return to the, 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 the spirit of the Islamic spirit of conquest. And similar images of, um, of Islam's constructed masculinity can be found uh, uh, in uh, Le Récit La Zawiya, in the, her text, uh, not La Zawiya, sorry, Fantasia, Fantasia um, which is about, Fantasia means a sort of cavalcade. And the, the text is precisely about a cavalcade, uh, uh, grandiose cavalcade held in honor of a, of, of a marabout, uh, marabout that is a, a holy man, uh, Sheikh Sidi Muhammad Liman. So the believers are, uh, are made to incarnate a traditional ideal of masculinity through uh, a repetitive and obviously admiring focus on their robust bodies, gigantic stature, uh, energetic manly heads, all these occupations, okay, the way she describes the, these believers in the, in the text. Uh, the, and of course, the, the masterful handling of their rifles. And the... Um, uh, they are singing, of course, uh, to welcome, the, the, they start to chant in order to welcome the arrival of the holy man. 
but as they as they are this as they are as they are singing together, the chant is the chant is said to be powerful as if quote emerging from a thousand lungs. So I have tried to give several examples of the way Islam is masculine is clearly associated with two things: masculinity and power. Uh, but um, and of course, in this society, which is highly masculinized, masculine and masculinized by Isabella Berhard, she had herself to borrow a male identity. She herself had to borrow a male um, uh, identity, otherwise she couldn't empower herself. I mean, a woman in, the, in such a patriarchal environment couldn't uh, feel empowered. And as, uh, as it, it was, of course, her, her desire to, to reach empowerment, she had to, to, to masculinize herself in this over-masculinized culture, culture. And this allowed her to escape the obedience and, uh, seclude, and secluded life, which were the common lot of Muslim, of Muslim women. Uh, and not only she dressed like a man, she borrowed male attire, but she called herself a, a talib. She, 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 a talib is a, is a student of the Quran of the Sunnah, he's a very knowledgeable way well-read, a well-read young man. So of course, this position, these two power signifiers, masculinity and knowledge, um, positioned her de facto uh, at the top of the hierarchy. She became a very well-respected, very well-listened to um, young, young man, between inverted commas, that is. Uh, she, she, she could afford to, to give advice, to provide advice, um, not only to the... Uh, not only to the uh, to the commoners, to common believers, but also to the marabouts themselves. She befriended marabouts and could uh, and could uh, afford to give them uh, advice to which they listened to with with respect to the hafsa. Um, and this, but not only she she does not only masculinize her, herself. And we, I'm here moving to the second part of the talk. In addition to masculinizing herself, she had to feminize uh, to feminize the natives themselves. And this creates a sort of paradox because I have just shown that she masculinizes them. She, by becoming a Muslim, she, she became a Muslim, she adopted Islam, and she believes that power is associated with masculinity. So on the one hand, she had to masculinize, she had to masculinize the, Muslim, is the Islam to which she chose to belong. But on the other hand, as a, West, as a Western woman, she had to reverse the gender schema and to masculinize herself while feminizing the Muslims. So that she can be the one who decides and the one who plans and the one in order to, to empower themselves herself at the expense of the natives. And I'm going now to give examples of this ambivalence. For example, in Lazawia, the text from which I have been quoting at the beginning, despite the powerful masculinization, the description of the words and in which I have read, uh, she, she describes two other friends, two other male friends with whom she's attending the, the prayer. So one of the two friends is said to be a purely masculine nature. So we're still within, still within the logic of masculinization. But the other friend is, I mean, and, uh, this, and this is a very surprising description, is said to be voluptuous, I'm quoting here, voluptuous and refined, like a sensitive woman that, that any brutal contact would make suffer. Of course, here she's speaking about her male friend, um, her male Muslim friend, and she's comparing him to a sensitive woman. So there is not this feminization of this man here, uh, voluptuous and refined like a sensitive woman that any brutal contact would make suffer. So degree of delicacy of this man. And she makes this man, this oriental man, whose name is Ahmed uh, in the text, she makes him sanction his own feminization. This man, this Muslim man, Ahmed, tells Isabella Berhardt, uh, or Mahmoud Sadi, how more virile your, you, uh, how more virile than mine your nature is, and how better fit than I am you are for the harsh struggles of life. So he's speaking to this man, uh, speaking to a woman, and telling her you are more virile. How more virile than my, my than, than myself you are. Uh, so in so here we have the gender uh, the. the, the the gender schema is clearly reversed. The man is, mas is feminized and the Western woman is, uh, is masculinized. And this fits within the traditional oriental discourse. So the feminization of the East is, tr is a traditional uh, trope uh, in, Western, in, uh, in Western orientalist discourse. Uh, and this also, again, this uh, shows again 
this um, that Eberhardt was not immune to the influence of Western discourse of her time. She, she was immune neither to will to power nor to the influence of, of the influence of her contemporaries. So, uh, but what is interesting now? I'll give uh, other examples uh, of, on this, of this feminization of, of Muslims. Uh, and then I will command. Uh, the, the description of the mosque prayer is not always rendered in power evoking terms as in Lazawiya. For example, in Non Luminor Sacré, one of her texts, the, the, the call to pray, to pray is said to be plaintive, so associated with weakness, plaintive. And in the Friday prayer, prayer, and this is a very interesting text, the voice, the Imam's voice is cr cracked and quavering, it's said to be cracked and quavering. Uh, through the trope of the, the, the trope of the sonorous and of uh, the strong and sonorous voice is still present in this essay, but uh, its effect is mitigated not only by imams, but the, ima the imam's own voice, which is uh, which I have said is cracked and quavering, but by the performance of fellow believers. As in Fantasia, the latter recite litanies in honor of the prophets. However, and this is interesting. Now they are no longer said to be raucous and warlike. Their voice is no longer said to be raucous and warlike, but, but rather very coat, very pure and beautiful. And I think we agree that these two adjectives, pure and beautiful, are more readily uh, used in a feminine context than, than in a masculine one. So, um, and, um, and as such, they mark a departure from the celebration of power and masculinity that we have seen so far, uh, uh, that we have illustrated so far. And this is completed by the intrusion of children. Children are very rarely present in Eberhard texts, but in this text, the uh, Friday prayer, uh, in addition to the description of the voices as, uh, as um, uh, sorry, as cracked and quavering and as also pure and beautiful, so uh, weak and feminine, uh, there is, uh, there is, there is uh, also the presence of children. Okay, so feminization and and, and maybe infantilization at the same time. So uh, and what is and there is another interesting detail, which is that the evocation, the focus is no longer on pride and spirit of conquest as we have seen so so, so far, but on the uh, the duty of submission that is expected from Muslims. She describes the Muslim the believers bending. Abandon and prostrate in themselves, say that is in the position of prayer. They are praying, and this is, of course, uh, these, these are positions that are expected of Muslims that they are praying, of course, to abandon. But this was not previously that she didn't choose to describe that. Now she describes this abandon and this duty of submission. She associates Islam with submission rather than with power, as, as we have previously said. See, and the, the overall atmosphere is not one of triumph, but one of quote gr great sweet, uh, great sweet calmness. So sweetness, calmness, purity, beauty, very feminine adjectives. And it, why am I insisting so much on this text, for Prière, du Vendredi, uh, Prière du Vendredi or Friday prayer? It's because this is what, precisely one of the texts written by Eberhardt during her sojourn on the Algerian Moroccan frontier. After, uh, after um, Lyote, her friend Lyote sent her to ask as, to work as a liaison agent um, with, the, with the hostile tribes. So at odds with Eberhardt's new objective of, subject, of subjecting the uncooperative Muslims of Morocco to, to the colonial authority, the rhetoric of strength and conquest which fitted her search for empowerment through Islam had to be erased and her religion had to be rewritten as one of peace and tolerance. And the past now is no longer uh, not, is evoked not to highlight Islam's martial exploits, but to emphasize new values and code and always, and like always, surely long ago, sorry, surely like long ago, about 200 years ago, when the blessed Sheikh Muhammad professed his humanitarian and mystic teachings, a great serene calmness reigns over the valley and the Tsar. So a uh, peace again, calmness and humanitarianism, Shiri. And this, there, there is an interesting uh, quotation about humanitarianism, humanitarianism, humanitarianism in the following quotation. The Ziania Marabout, uh, Marabout, our holy man, have a reputation for being friendly to France. They are peaceful, humane people who welcome any force for justice. So here, the, the, the Ziania was the people who, among whom she was sojourning on the Moroccan frontier. So this is a, a Sufi Zawiyah. 
And she describes them as peaceful humane people. But what is interesting is that at the same time, she says that they have a reputation for being friendly to France. So it is as if the true understanding of Islam implies accept the acceptance of, of, of France, of the French occupation. Uh, on the other hand, in the same way as she, uh, she hails those who welcome the, the French presence as humane and peaceful, she criticizes, she looks askance at those who, uh, uh, the Moroccans who, who hate the Christians, as she said. Um, this, this hatred, according to her quote, forgets Islam pure principles, principles of tolerance. Now, I'm going to give a, a striking image of Eberhard's feminization of Moroccan Muslims in her accounts, uh, account of a, uh, amusements of a group of students who also happen to be sons of marabouts, of holy men. Uh, so in the lux in luxurious and refined interior, Eberhard informs her readers that the young men, these uh, marabout sons, would often lift up their spirits with good conversation and needlework. Needlework, which is traditionally, especially at that time, clearly considered to be a feminine activity. Now she's describing her as a young man in, involved in, in, in this occupation. The, uh, I'm quoting here, the meeting passes in conversation as if to make clear the recreational intimacy after our presentations, one of the Muslim men returns to his shoeing and looks for silk, silks for a white gandura that he is decorating with delicate embroidery. Among the Moroccan students, this shoe and cloth ornamentation work is favored. They are proof of taste and even engaging in it in public is not demeaning. So uh, here there's, the, 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 I think the feminization of Muslims here is very, is very obvious here, but more revealing still is the feminization of the Moroccan landscapes themselves. So uh, she describes her journey with her guide in Barak from Algeria to Morocco, from, from from the western, the west of Algeria to Morocco, and as she describes this, I mean, there's a, there's a striking difference between the the Algerian landscapes as she describes them and the Moroccan landscapes. Moroccan um, Algerian landscapes, Bilbashar, for example, is said to be very abrupt. So there is an aggressive verticality in the landscapes of um, in the landscapes of Algeria. But as they move westward, that is towards Morocco, the, towards Morocco, these uh, landscapes become softer. Uh, the aggressive uh, verticality of the abrupt Jebel Bishar disappears, gives way to funny looking hills named on account of their appearance, Bizaz al Kalba, which means dog's teeth. So now from the Jbal, the impressive Jbal vertical aggressivity of the, of the mountain, Jbal Bashar, they move to dog steeds, very fe obvious feminization here, then to the smooth curvedness of the dunes. All right, uh, coat, golden sand, soft undulations, always the same countryside since we left the desert Kilba. The same monotonous harmony of great soups without angles. So angles disappear. And what we have now is uh, curves, soft curves, etc., which evoke uh, femininity, femininity again. I know it's interesting to reflect on this feminization. Why is it fe Moroccans are feminized and even the landscapes are feminized? It's interesting to relate that to, the, to Eberhard's positioning within the, the colonial conflict, precisely. The difference between Algeria, the masculinized Algeria, and feminized Morocco is that Algeria was sub, was already sub, subdued by um, it was already French. Algeria had become French. It was under it had been sub, subjected by French, French colonial regime, whereas whereas Morocco it was in a state of resistance, was uh, re rejecting all right the uh, the uh, what is it the uh, the French French colonization. So uh, the representation of Moroccans as frail as, as an effeminate clearly betrays a will to denigrate resistance to colonialism while valorizing the good Muslim. On the other hand, the good Muslim, the one who has accepted the French, uh, French presence is valorized by being masculinized because uh, as I have said at the beginning, Eberhard does, subs does subscribe to the patriarchal prejudice uh, according to which man is superior. I mean, this is this is beyond the scope of this talk, but there are several instances which show that Eberhard dis despised women, despised women, and, ha and ha that her admiration went to, went, went to men. 
So, uh, uh, Linda, if you could please uh, oh, okay, okay. Uh, conclude so, with... Okay, I'll just finish this. I mean, I Thank won't you say, very much. Okay, I won't say everything, but I'll try to, to conclude. Right, uh, so... Um, so I'll just give other, uh, so, sorry, I know I'm a little bit, I've been a little bit, disturbed. anyway. So this valorization and masculination of loyalty as uh, Eberhard so rewrites submission is well illustrated in the following passage. The Arab understands masculine honor and he wants to die as a brave man facing the enemy, but he has absolutely no desire for posthumous glo glory, especially these simple men, these crude nomads who voluntarily offer their valor their beautiful audacity and their inexhaustible endurance to the service of Christ. So what we have here is an in-between position in which, the, the, uh, uh, in addition to this some masculinization and feminization, sometimes she masculinizes those uh, Muslims by, but by associating this masculinity with loyalty to France. I mean, there, there was much more I would have liked to say, I mean, uh, uh, about the, the way, Berhardt uh, associates loyalty to France with uh, good practice of Islam. For her, for her, the two go, go together. And I would have liked to speak a, a little also about uh, Eberhard's association of Islam with light and of Muslims of Muslims with darkness. Uh, but well, I've just said it now, you know, in a, in a word. So maybe there'll be other opportunities to discuss this a little bit further. So I'll stop it here, and I thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is really very informative and it's very interesting how uh, these uh, concepts of masculinity and femininity are often contradictory in, in the way she imagined Muslims, uh, in fact, on the, whether they are on the Algerian side or on the Moroccan side, when they are subdued and when they are still resisting. Etc. Etc. This really shatters all the myths and stereotypes. We we think that these Oriental or Western Orientalist women, I would call them, mm -hmm. uh, have in 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 the way they have encountered and experienced their Orients. I think I shouldn't really hijack the discussion, but open the floor for your contributions, comments, questions. Um, over to you, please. Any questions? Maybe Ikram can break <laughs> the ice or Hatun, you, if you want to say something. Um, yeah, um, well, uh, thank you very much, Linda. This is a very, um, uh, it's a different word from what you would expect. Uh, uh, a very, uh, a Swiss woman who becomes Muslim, not any, any Muslim, she becomes a, uh, a Sufi as well. She and then she be, get involved in liaison. I don't know if liaison is has anything to do with espionage or what. I don't know. But um, I mean everything. She, she's like as if she's uh, representing everything. Um, you would think about uh, an Orientalist gaze as well as I don't know if she's also an opportunist. I don't know, <laughs> but it seems so. Uh, Okay, my my very simple question is: Was she at the end, or did she at the end become a writer, or a, a good writer, or famous writer? Yeah. Okay. Shall I answer right now, or shall yes, I? Yes, take... please. Yes, go ahead. Right. right. Yeah, I think um, I think Eberhard. Well, I'm being a bit subjective here, but I think she is a fascinating figure because she, she is a sum of several of. of several opposites i mean i mean on the one hand um she was a man and a woman she was a muslim and a westerner she was uh she was an anti-colonial figure but in the complex of colonialism at the same time she, she so she was she was so many things at the same time so many contradictory things at the same things at the same time um and of recently the uh, the object of my 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 study is to show that i mean on the face of it, I mean, she seems to be a very um, uh, a friend of the natives, and she was a friend of the natives. She had served, she had a lot of native friends, and, and and she does denounce colonial malpractice. I mean, she denounces the abuses of colonization, the injustices of colonization, and all. But on the other hand, as we as I have just shown, she did take part also in in in, in the colonial project. 
Um, so she was considered to be a feminist on the one hand because she has she led a very atypical lifestyle for 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 19th century woman, but on the other hand, she subscribed to the to to the patriarchal patriarchal prejudice and. So, so, and, and this is what is fascinating about her. She was a very complex figure. Uh, now, uh, of course, she became a writer. Of course, I know uh, she became a writer. But to what extent she was a great writer? I think the word, uh, the adjective you have used is great. I mean, this is very debatable. Because there are a lot of critics who uh, think that Eberhardt's greatest novel, greatest uh, creation was her own life. All right, and they considered her life to be superior to her literary work. Um, but I think this is a bit unfair because, of, of course, there is no, there isn't much, you know, there's nothing, stun, you know, surprise, wow, in him, if I, if I may use the word, in ever in Everhart's writing, there is, um, there's nothing really surprising, you know, stunning about her writing. But uh, I think. I, th I think there, there is a lot of depth and sincerity in spite of all in, the, in what in, in what she, in what she writes, uh, and I think we must not forget the, the fact that she died at a very young age, at the age of twenty-seven, etc. And that um, uh, she, there was probably more potential than 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 what, than we, we could actually see. That means because she wrote in you know. Uh, while leading a very nomadic life, very vagrant life, it's, uh, she, and her life became very difficult after some time. Uh, poverty, uh, uh, dangers, uh, escaping, escaping. Uh, she, she, she was nearly assassinated. You know all these sort sort of things. So, um, but I think if she had, if her life had been different, maybe she would have been. A better or maybe worse writer, who knows? Because I mean, that, that's it. But I don't think that she was such so such a bad writer as that. I think it's, that's uh, that's harsh as a judgment. I think it was really harsh as a judgment. Thank you, Thank you very much. I think we're ready. having some yes. questions. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry? Yeah. yeah. I think we're having uh, some questions in the uh, in the chat. Uh, Zahi, you want to take them? Yes, please. Amina Ansari, one of our PhD students, she says in her portrayal as a man, how significant was the gender dress code in Islam? Without it, would her self-portrayal as a man still be possible? And the second question from Fatima Saadi, also she's a, a, a PhD student. She says, can we still consider calling her Muslim, knowing she was not traditionally a practitioner of Islam in that sense? especially if we look at the mainstream Islam uh, that has different interpretations of Sufism. And she adds special, her life was lived in the open, defying all odds and traditions of Islam. Yeah, that's, uh, that's right. So um, I'll answer the question about cross-dressing first. Um, sorry, can you remind me of the question? Uh, I know it's- The, the but... first one is, is this, uh, the gendered dress code in Islam. She says in her portrayal as a man, how significant was the gendered dress code in Islam? Yeah, well, uh, I think um, it, it, dep it depends. If you take Sunni Islam, uh, I think uh, Muslim women are associated with the, uh, the imperative of modesty, etc., and even of veiling, you know, some of the traditional representation of women. And it's true that, of course, all Muslim uh, women at that time in North Africa were, were veiled, etc. Eberhard, precisely uh, her cross dressing was certainly one way of escaping this imperative. She certainly didn't want to 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 become um, to become just an ordinary Muslim woman. As I have said, the central thesis here is her quest for power. She wanted to empower herself. And so certainly the predicament of women, uh, of Muslim women at that time was maybe even today, but especially at that time was far from empowering. And that's why she must, this is the dress code. This is why she, she cross-dressed as she dressed as a man. Now, of course, this went counter, uh, this went against the, uh, the dress code, the Islamic dress code uh, at that time, especially in Sunni Islam, because if you take Sufism, I mean, it seems there were marabouts, so there were uh, uh, female saints uh, in Sufism who were allowed to to, um, to travel Islam, to, to, to travel alone, sorry, and sometimes to dress as, 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 as men precisely. And this is 
this uh, makes it legitimate to suppose that precisely the attraction of Sufism in particular, among all other forms of Islam, uh, was was precisely because it also contributed to serving her quest for power. It's more empowering for a woman to be a Sufi woman than to be um, than to be a Sunni woman, for example, because uh, women. Um, uh, Sufi women had access to knowledge, could uh, could become saints, could, as I have said, could could travel on their own. It's a, a saints, not a, not all Sufi women, etc. But and so uh, yes, so she she clearly didn't respect the the dress code of that of her time of Islamic code of her time uh, for uh, for the sake of empowering her empowering herself. It's easy, it's certainly easier for a woman, easier and safer for a woman to travel. Uh, in male disguise than to dress, uh, than to travel, as to show her, to reveal her female identity. That's it. And uh, so, yes, uh, can, she, can we consider her as a Muslim in spite of all? I, I think she was a Muslim. And uh, in, in her, in her, she, she observed, the, she, she scrupulously observed the, day, the, the Ramadan fasting and uh, the prayers. It seems she observed, she, she respected the, the prayers and the, the, the Ramadan fasting. And um, and and her faith she is sincere because when you read her diary, her diary, her, her journalier, uh, you get you get an insight, you get insight into her the way she thought, you know, she, her, her her deepest self, her deepest thoughts, her deepest convictions, etc. Uh, and here you can see the, that she, that she believed in Islam. She sincerely believed in Islam. Uh, when she was ex expelled from Algeria, at a given time she was ex expelled from Algeria, and so she had to go to her to France and lived with her at her brothers. Uh, she would uh, write letters to to her uh, to her husband Sliman Ahni, asking him to send her the dik the dikr. The dikr is a sort of prayers which, which are recited by the Sufis. So even if when she is in France. She's thinking about Baker. Baker. She was thinking. She's thinking about her prayers. So I think when you take all this into consideration, it's different to decide that she is not a Muslim to exclude her from Islam. However, and this is part of the argument I, I develop in in the study. Um, her, it's true that her practice of Islam was a highly carnivalized one. But that is, uh, she oscillated between the sinful and the, and the saintly and the sinful, the virtuous and the sinful, and the and sinful. On the one on the one hand. As they have said, she observed the religious duties like prayers and and uh, and, uh, and the fasting. On the other hand, on the other hand, she uh, she indulged in drinking, in kef, that is, in drugs, uh, and and led a very promiscuous life, etc. So of course, she departed from a lot of religious instruct instructions while. Uh, while respecting others, but then this is the case of many Muslims even today. There are a lot of Muslims who uh, who do not follow strictly uh, the, the religious teachings, but who can, who do consider themselves Muslims or the or the same or the same. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Linda. I think Sonia is it Sonia Lamani had a question. I saw a hand. No. Um, yes, yes, go ahead. Oh, it's Amina. 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 Okay, okay. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Sweden, for this brilliant talk. Uh, my question for you is, and this might well be beyond the scope of your research, but I'm interested in knowing if you have been able to identify the ways in which the figure of Isabelle Berhardt, but also her writings, are celebrated and promoted in the Algerian post-colonial literature such as Yasmina Khadra, Secret le Mirage de Watal Oasis, or even Medica Moqaddam in um, Le Siècle des Sauterelles, where we have the major character who is Mahmoud, who is clearly the name of Isabel, but also the uh, secondary character is Yasmin, which reminds us maybe of Yasmina, who wants to follow the, the footpath and also the traces of Isabel Eberhardt. So can you tell us how you can make sense of the maybe appropriation of the figure um, of Isabel Eberhardt in post-colonial writings? Okay, uh, so uh, indeed, this is um, a little bit beyond the scope of, uh, of my research indeed, but um, I suppose uh, the fascination that the Eberhardt had always had on, on even on contemporaries is still present today. So it's not surprising to find that writers that like Yasmina uh, Khadra and Melika uh, Muqaddam refer to this figure in their writings or, uh, you know, 
Um, I haven't read these novels. I haven't read the Le Cycle de Sotrel by Malika Mukaddam, but she does evoke her in other texts. Oh, for example, I think in Maison, she mentions briefly Isabelle Eberhardt, etc. So Isabelle Eberhardt, especially for writers like the Malika Mukaddam, who uh, who um, you know uh, advocates this this ideal of freedom, especially for women, you know something like that. Um, uh, Isabella Berhat maybe incarnated the spirit of freedom for her, this nomadic spirit or this wo wo woman who who roamed North Africa freely, who who didn't care who um, uh, of the um, who didn't pay attention to the dress code of the, of her time and to uh, who blurred the dichotomies or the existing dichotomies masculinity, femininity, Islam. Uh, or uh, you know, the fact of not believing, or all, all that. Uh, and she was a southerner. Uh, Malika Muqaddim is from Bishar, from Qnedza, from Qnedza, that is from the, the Algerian desert, Algerian Sahara precisely. So this connection also explains the, her attraction to Isabella Berhart, who lived in a, both Yasmina Khadra and Malika Muqaddim are from, uh, from the same region, more or less, from uh, Bishar, Qnedza, et cetera, so the Algerian South. And that's precisely, um, uh, adds to their attraction, you know, accentuates their attraction to this this figure who spent most of her life in the Algerian desert, precisely. Mm -hmm. That's it. But I think it's more than that. Meant that, that it's all that that spirit, the, the, this idealization of uh, of the figure of Everhart, who, who is associated with freedom, with you know, uh, 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 breaking the bonds with the system of power. You know, this sort of. I think this is this is this is. A, this is it, but this is precisely the myth between inverted commas that I have tried to deconstruct in my study because I show Isabella Berhad that you know Isabella Berhad was, was not was not that spirit that free spirit that she, that she is often taken to be. It's mm -hmm. more complex than that than that. But she still this is still what she incarnates for a lot of writers. Yes, I have a chapter in my thesis where I analyze uh, the the figure of Isabella Berhad in Malika Mukaddam's writings. And I make a case for, for the ways in which uh, Malika Muqaddam celebrates Eberhardt uh, to imagine a different destiny for her characters. Mm -hmm. As you yes, said, by transforming. Very, yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. I, I'd love to read it when you. When, when, <laughs> and I can see that my, my external examiner is, is here as well. <laughs> oh, okay, great. <laughs> okay. It's, it's really uh, actually very uh, interesting to see that uh, amongst the young uh, Algerian scholars, there's a lot of interest. Uh, on the work of Isabel Eberhardt, not just Isabel Eberhardt, but all the women uh, from France and Europe who sojourned in Algeria. And most importantly, uh, which you didn't touch on, Linda, their rapport with the local women. So could you say a little bit on that? How did she or not interact with local women as, as, as a, a woman herself? Yeah, and yeah. I haven't found a trace of the local women in her writings. Well, she, she doesn't, in the, well, she, most, she spent most of her time with men. She was just, she, just, she, she called herself Mahmoud Saadi. And so she was supposed to be a man and she spent most of her time with men. However, she had an opportunity, uh, a couple of opportunities to, to interact with men, women. And you can find two contrasting uh, representations of the women she met. For example, one, uh, she spent some time in Betna. All right, she's lived for some time in Betna. Mm -hmm. And when she describes the women she had to live with, I mean, she describes her life as unbearable here because the women were unbearable. I mean, the, they, the, 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 the subjects of discussion are very trivial. They are they, they, there is nothing interesting about them. Uh, they're fighting over, over, over trifles. It's a, so there's a clear contempt in the way she describes these, these, these women. Um, and this, this is very recurrent. I mean, her representation of women is often marked by this contempt that, that I have, of which I have given an example. Mm -hmm. However, when she, when she describes outstanding women, for example, when she, she meets Leila Zainab, Leila Zainab is, was at the head of the, uh, the, Zawiya, the Zawiya Rahmaniya. Uh, not far from Busa'ad. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Not far from Busa'ad, exactly. So when she meets that woman, she cle she's clearly impressed by that woman. And this joins the, this, conf this confirms or at least supports the idea of her uh, fascination by power. Because this woman, Leila Zainab, was at the head of the Zawiya. And she, um, she, she defied both French authorities and her own brothers 
uh, in order to, to replace her father at the head of the Zawiya. She, they didn't want a woman to be at the head of, of the Zawiya, but she had to fight both the French and her, uh, her own clan in order to become... Uh, so this, this was a well-respected woman. This was a, a woman of power, etc. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, she, speaks, she speak, speaks about her with a lot of respect, with a lot of admiration. So uh, a woman has to stand out for... Uh, for for Isabel, Isabel Eberhardt, uh, in order to win her resp respect. And this is not applicable on men because she befriended all sorts of men. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. not necessarily, she did befriend Maraboots, but not only Maraboots, she just be 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 befriended just commoners as well. But women, um, it's difficult to win, to win Eberhardt's respect when you are a woman, if, we may, if I may put it this way. But, uh, mm -hmm. that, that was clear. They, they were always looked at as uh, unworthy of attention, and, um, not only in the work of, of Eberhardt, but in, in the work of many uh, French writers, especially of the 19th and early 20th century. Um, any, anyone has a question? I anyone think else? Shirin Zubair had her hand up. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you still interested in uh, asking something or commenting, Shirin? Uh, no, I, I was uh, clapping. I didn't have my hand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I, I, I have noticed that many uh, participants are uh, entering after five o'clock. Was there a confusion in the way we advertise this event? Uh, actually, I myself thought that it would be at 7 p.m. here because in Paris time, uh, it's supposed to be 7 p.m. And when I tried to, to to connect to Zoom. Uh, luckily, I was informed that the uh, the meeting would start at six. So I found this almost by chance. So mm -hmm. I don't know what, the way it happened with the other with yeah. other participants. Perhaps we should put put um, be more uh, specific in the way we advertise the time in the future. I'm very sorry about that. We yeah, we put for example, add a Saudi time next to it. <laughs> yes, yes, we, we should be more specific. Mm -hmm. um, I think we should bring this to a close, I'm afraid. Um, we have gone over our allocated one hour. But really, thank you very much, Linda. Thank you very much, Ikram. Thank you very much to all of you who have attended this lecture. I hope we will see you again uh, in the next lecture. We will advertise it in the same way, but we will pay more attention to the time and how we advertise it next time. Uh, excuse um, me, Zahi, there was a question here. A question? Go ahead. Cassie uh, Zik. Who's Cassie Zik? Uh, would you be able to expand upon how um, Eberhard is experience having more of a marginalized status in Europe during her youth um, may have affected her perspective, perspective during her journey? And was it just a catalyst for her search for power or did you believe it affected her writing more than that? I think well, Linda has addressed this in the lecture. Uh, th this lecture is recorded and we will circulate the recording and uh, there will be an answer to this question in that. We really need to bring it to a close. So thank you very much uh, to all of you. And we hope to see you in the future lectures. Thank you. Uh, could you um, just uh, maybe we need to give them an idea of uh, the next lecture's time. I think uh, it's going to be about Iran, isn't it? Uh, we had we yes the, I think I will I will circulate an advert. The, that speaker has COVID currently. So okay. we will have to oh. reschedule that one and, and see how we move on. Okay. okay. Yeah. okay. You'll, you'll hear from us. Yes. Attending around the, re the recording as well as the next uh, announcement. Thank you very much indeed. And, and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.